Linda Albertano. It's January 12th. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. And it's great to have a few folks here in the audience. Yes, indeed. The first question is, what is the best thing for a human being? The best thing for a human being is to be loved. Oh, that's To be good. cherished. Yeah. You know, just to have someone that is completely on your side. Isn't that a good word, cherished? I like that answer. Just, yeah, who loves you unconditionally. Yeah. You can do no wrong. When in your life did you feel most loved? <sighs> like, was there a moment? When Indeed. You... My, with my mom. My mom gave me that kind of love. And it, I'm getting emotional about this. Oh, please, that's fine. <laughs> because um, <clears throat> I did not grow up with my mother. I grew up in foster homes. So So you mean your biological mom? Yeah. With your biological mom. So then when was the split from your biological mom? Um at the age of 7. Wow. But my mom was such a wonderful incredible creature. Wow. She was an artist. She never raised her voice. She never struck us. My brother and I, she she completely um reasoned with us as children and I know people say oh you can't reason with children or they don't they don't have the mental capacity for it but I remember that and I appreciated it so much and it's it's made everything else seem it's made the way the world runs seem very odd to me that people just want to take up arms right so what amazing so what is your favorite form of information Hmm. I like movies. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> yeah. Wow. So did you grow up watching movies on no. TV or in movie theaters? Um, oh. I like to go to the movies and I like movies on TV. And, but but um, when did you first start seeing movies? Um, well, my dad took me to see Diabolique. That's the first movie I ever remember seeing because my mom taught me to read at a very early age and it was, of course, it was subtitles. It was a scary, scary French what movie. What age is this? I, th- I think about five. So then at seven, you were without your biological mom and your biological dad? Right, and there were no more books, movies, anything. You know, because my mom taught me to read, and we were reading um, Ogden Nash, and we were reading Somerset Mom, and, and, and then I went to these odd uh, homes that were selected by the state. Right. And there were no books. There was nothing. It was barren. There was no fun, no books. In fact, in one of them, everything that my mother had taught me to love was a sin. Ooh. Dancing was a sin. Jewelry was a sin. Playing Monopoly was a sin. Listening to the radio was a sin. And of course, going to the movies was a big sin. Wow. <laughs> That's like, you're, you're making me bury off from my normal questions. Who would you like to sin with, if you could sin with anyone? (laughs) (laughs) Well, dancing is my favorite sin. Wow, that's good. So just a dance partner. Yeah. (laughs) But let's get back to information, Linda. That was good. And I love tangents, so you already got us going. Why do you think people collect information? Hmm. Well, I, I know I'm a pack rat, so I just collect everything. And in fact, I am collecting too much information these days. Oh, yeah. Um, I find that I know that the more that I try to hog of information and devour it, and um, that the less I retain, yeah. and that I'm becoming more scattered. But I just tend to be kind of a pack rat and to not want to throw things away. And, and I always feel like there's something that people know that I might be left out of if I don't get that piece of information. I'm just always on the hunt for that special piece of information. I am too. <laughs> I go through like 20, 30 magazines and newspapers a day, like finding articles. And the guy goes, what are you looking for? I says, something might change my life. You never know. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, do you think this need or want to collect information is hardwired, or did we learn it? 
I, my guess is that it's just kind of hardwired because when you're around people who are in um, oral traditions, they just seem to know so much, and they seem to collect. I, you know, because I've I've spent uh, some time in Africa, and I noticed that. My God, they speak so many languages. They, all of them at, in Guinea spoke five languages, five African languages. And then they usually spoke two or three other languages. They at least spoke French, and then a lot of them spoke English and Spanish. And then I met so many who spoke Russian, German, Hungarian, you know, just outlandish languages. So yeah. I think they were information magnets. It's amazing. And, well, the other thing, too, is that they knew so much more about our political system than we do. And about, I mean, they were so much better informed about politics. And you're saying they're more oral or just exclusively oral culture? You're saying they do read, but they're more oral oriented. Yes, and, because, and I think yeah. that the written word was invented very late for them. Yeah, because that's the big thing in studying McLuhan is that we shifted when we stopped having just spoken word to printed word that two things happened that people aren't aware of. We lost a lot of imagination skills because if I told you something and then you told Bob something, uh -huh. you would embellish it with your imagination. Uh -huh. And say, let me tell you something, Bob, I heard. And then you would embellish it, so you're imagining. <laughs> but now I just give you a Xerox, and you give him the Xerox. Mm -hmm. So it's printed word. And then memory. So imagination and memory. Oh, yes. So then you, I say, blah, 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 and then you repeat it to him. You, you're you flexing, you're building your uh, memory skills. Because you had to use memory. If I give you Xerox, you don't have to remember anything. You just give it to him. <laughs> right, right. Oh, they have prodigious memory skills. That's true. Yeah. Because, um, you know, I studied uh, Cora and Bologna with, I studied Cora with Prince Jabati, and then he invited me to go to Africa to learn the Bologna, which is the West African base. Uh -huh. The Cora is the West African harp. Okay. But um, he was a griot, and the griots are like the walking encyclopedias. So there are certain family names in Africa. And he knew the whole history, you know, of every family. And uh, in fact, sometimes I just there's a huge West African population in LA. Yeah. And so he would be called upon to go to their homes, and I would get to accompany him with the Cora to to play and to speak their whole oral tradition. And we'd go to a place in the valley, and they would open the door and be there in their beautiful uh, West African colors and costumes. And we'd just sit at the couch, and there would um, be a coffee table in front of us. And the way that the griot lives is is through contribution. So as he would as he would be relating their history, they would be dropping bills. You know, they would be dropping dollars into this plate in front of him. Nice. And, uh, yeah. Beautiful. A huge imagination and huge memory. On memory, can you conjure up your earliest memory ever? Yes. Can you tell us this? Well, I mean, I don't think I remembered much before three, but I remember being in my father's arms at night in Ogden, Utah, and we were between the coal sheds and the apartments going down this narrow, it was very cold, just down a narrow path, it was really cold, and an animal ran and crossed in front of us, and my dad said, a wolf. <laughs> and then they just talked about it for days later, saying that the, it was so cold that winter that the wolves were driven down from the hills. Wow. So, Do you think memory is more a curse or more a blessing? Oh, intriguing, intriguing. I'm, I tend to use it as a curse. <laughs> <laughs> because I like to remember everything I've ever done wrong and beat myself up for it oh. for hours of an end. <laughs> Can you um, tell us your earliest role models within your immediate family and outside your immediate family? And not necessarily a huge list, just briefly, one or two immediate family role models and what specifically did you get from them? Well... You know, my mom was raised as a Mormon, so we didn't, and, and then she broke away from it. So we pretty much didn't have other family members around. Um, 
she was a great role model, but I have to say that I had the pleasure of meeting my great-grandmother, and she was a wonderful, wonderful woman. She was so kind, she, and she could do everything. My great-grandmother, and my mom too, because my mom used to, my mom was an artist, my mom was a singer, my mom made our furniture, she made our toys, she made our clothes, and I would just spend hours you know, making paper dolls and things with her that were really creative and really fun. Uh, but my grandmother, you know, my grandmother had a herd of cattle. She was a milliner. She had a farm. She had a great, you know, she had great vines. She could just do all that stuff. And uh, It's amazing because do you know how often I get grandparents over parents? Because usually you say immediate family, they go, well, of course, my parents. But so often you get that one notch, like, because the grandparents are like, we can play. And your parents are like, you can't do that. <laughs> well, my mom did play with us all the time. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, yeah. Now, outside your immediate family and not necessarily um, early, it could be any time in your life, a major role model. And what specifically did you get from them? Well, um, when I moved into Venice, um, what year is that about? Late sixties. Um, we had a big house. Um, my partner Frank Lentz and I, and our, our friend Cheryl, we actually bought a house with our college loan money. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and um, and then people would live with us. And there was one person, uh, a, a, a songwriter named Charles Duncan, uh -huh. who just came with the most amazing um, uh, intellectual stimulation, creative stimulation, and the most amazing group of friends on the planet. Wow. And I think that those friends just changed my life. In fact, Alicia Shapiro was part of that group he's here well, tonight. Well, Hilda Nealis, man. Yes, yes. Jeez, way to go. I rarely get the, the him. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah. So uh, did your parents raise you a particular religion? You talked about Mormon, but did they raise you a Mormon? No, my, okay. my mother abandoned the Mormon religion. Yeah. And um, But in the foster homes, I was raised as a fundamentalist. Did you practice or did you check out at some point? Well, I checked out when I went to college because they pretty much you know everything was a sin um, and and oh yeah I did not believe in evolution hmm. you know I just um, and, and of course when you go to college you're, you're exposed to ideas yeah in fact I was shocked to discover that the Christian religion was not the first and only religion on the planet and then, you know, you pick up a book and you find out that there have been 27 other virgin births. Oh, Buddha was a virgin birth. And, yeah. and you know, it just all starts to collapse and yeah. fall apart. Did you ever pick up another religion and practice it? Or are you... No, not really. No. Okay. Mm -mm. Now, this question is, um, do you think evil people exist or does evil use people as a vehicle? I, I actually think that evil uses people, but it, but it comes down historically. Mm. Um, you know, because my friend was talking about those kids in Ohio that raped the unconscious girl and were laughing about it on video. Right. And she said she thought it was, she blamed it on the parents. Um, and... But, but I mean, I, I think that it's also cultural and social. But I think that whatever came through those kids, may, some of it, part of it came through their parents and came from their grandparents and came from so long ago, which is why we're still fighting the Civil War. Yeah. You know. Beautiful. That was good. I'm going to jump ahead to a question because I don't bring it up as much, but it sort of leads to what, what you just said leads to it. Um, Frank Zappa made a commercial in the 60s. He says, don't do speed, it'll turn you into your parents. And uh, anti-speed commercial. Uh -huh. And uh, I sort of go, you don't have no choice. No matter what you do, you're going to turn into your parents. But we sort of think, well, if my yeah. parent's an alcoholic, I'll become an alcoholic. Or yeah. I won't become because he was. Right. And, and so I found, after 50, I found my male peer group would not say, I'm, 
freaking out because I'm turning into my mother. While most males are raised more by their mothers than their fathers. But my female peer group turning 50 would go, I'm freaking out because I'm turning into my mother. Now they, they would fret more. Uh -huh. They say, I'm turning into my mother. Right. And then they go, well, I'm turning my mother and that's good too. Right. Why do you, th do, you, do you see any difference why women would fret more than men? Well, yes, because I think that men create their identity by, um, by, by rejecting the mother at his, at, in their teen years. Mm. I mean, that's how they become who they are. Yeah. So, yeah, that makes sense to me. Good. And, boy, you're good. Um, what, what is the most significant difference between men and women, physical aside? Hmm, intriguing. Wow. I, you know, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, men are said to have a greater uh, sexual drive and women are said to be more nurturant. But I've read about uh, cultures. In fact, they say that hunter-gatherer cultures, where everything, you know, where, when, in other words, where the source of the income is shared equally by both. That, that men have very tender emotions and women can be leaders and yeah not that we have a shortage of women leaders here but yeah but there's still because we only make X number of cents per dollar that men yeah. make um, it puts us you know in, in a different position yeah why do you think women live longer than men well they say that women CEOs don't really <laughs> yeah Wow. So, but the, the, sometimes people go, they don't anymore. But in general, the, the sort of word is that women live longer than men. Right. Why do you think that would I be? I think men are just uh, subject to more incredible stress. Yeah. Very good. Well, that was a little divert. Back to the evil part. Not that <laughs> men and women are evil. Okay. How would you advise someone to deal with an enemy? And I'll set it up with a few modern thinkers' thoughts. Mm -hmm. Alan Watts says, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Coppola stole from the mob and the samurais. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer, morphed into the word frenemies. Um, JFK said, forgive your enemy, but don't forget their name. Uh, <laughs> Fellini says, I need an enemy. And lastly, Chinese proverb goes, he who cannot agree with their enemy will be controlled by them. So it's a lot of thoughts. The basic question is, how would you advise someone to deal with an enemy? But before you start, how would you specifically react to the first one, Alan Watts? If you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Hmm. I, I, I mean, I've, that's never occurred to me. If you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. I mean, what is meant by acknowledge them? Yeah. I say, I don't like that. I, don't, I hate Iran. Iran's yeah. Is it like that? Well, it's interesting because some people go, if you don't acknowledge it, your enemy, you empower them. Uh -huh. But it's sort of like, I think he's sort of saying, don't say stop war, say I want peace. So you're acknowledging war when you say stop war. Oh, so... So, so any sort of acknowledgement of the enemy, uh -huh. you know... And so a war I, itself is the enemy. Well, saying, that's just one way to put it, but you could say, well, stop Bush. You know, right? Well, or you could say, "I'm for Ralph Nader." Exactly. Instead, so yes. if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. You know, that's right. what he. I mean, that's how I interpret it. But. Yeah, that's also sort sort of the power of positive thinking, or that words are things, and so yeah, yeah. So when you give voice to something, then it has a greater chance of of materializing, of yeah. actualizing. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, as, in terms of the un enemies of the United States, I, I really wish that we were making bicycles and computers and baby carriages and dropping those on the people everywhere. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> you know? It's like Robin Williams says, we should fight wars with rubber chickens. <laughs> Your mama wears army boots. <laughs> you know? But it, I mean, it's so sad to me that all this tons of money oh. is being spent on bombs that just explode once. And yes, that's fun for everybody I know. Not everybody, but for some people. But, um, at, you know, and they say, well, we have to have a war economy because, you know, if we aren't building these bombs and, and then, you know. Then our economy will go kaput. But you can build other things that people will use and would like and will last. I mean. Did you hear the difference in the budget for PR for uh, people who are against gun or for gun control spend 16 mil a year. People who are the NRA spells 
spells, spends 300 mil a year. It's like, geez, could you give one mil to feed the homeless? <laughs> no, geez, 300 mil to sell, you know, that we should have guns? <laughs> Aye. Yeah. Okay, now, James Joyce was the first projectionist in Dublin about 100 years ago. He basically said, I'm out of here, this is stupid. Why should I go inside a building and see a movie of a tree when I can go outside and see a real tree? Years later, Faulkner says, sometimes the best fiction is more true than journalism. Why do we as humans have to recreate or reproduce things in order to get them? In other words, why do we have to go to a theatrical play of people acting out life? Why don't we just live life? No, there's a lot to be said for just living life. I mean, sometimes I'll watch a movie of people hiking or, you know, and just go, why aren't I doing that now? Yeah. Why am I watching them? That's crazy. <laughs> but really, um, they're stories, you know, and we love stories. And the stories connect us to us and and uh, put us more in touch of our, with our own humanity, our own foibles and our own wishes. And yeah. So there is that. Um, I, I do tend to err too much on the being sedentary side uh -huh. <laughs> but I, I've gotten out a bit yeah. I've gotten out a few times in life <laughs> come on you read poetry at all my events free of charge I don't mind <laughs> you're good so um, that was good and do you think hard, uh, storytelling is hardwired or is it something humans learned oh gosh um, my guess is okay I think it's hardwired but I do think that some people are better at it than others yeah yeah. Good. <laughs> so uh, Lewis Hines published pictures of child labor in newspapers, and cultural historians like to say that was the tipping point to change a law. So this question is about pointing at something that is the tipping point to change a law. Now, me and you know, and everybody in here, that it's more than just the photos of the child labor. There's a zeitgeist, there's something in the air, there's something more that's contributed to changing law. But they like to pinpoint it as that's a tipping point. That's the e moment. Even, even Leonard Cohen says, I want a poem that will change laws. And so then uh, Upton Sinclair, same thing. They say, the, the jungle, his novel about meat packaging, change the laws. So this question is about, if, has any film, art, theater, or movie actually been a tipping point to change laws? In other words, the hidden question is really, are these other art forms have the same impact as printed word? You know, I mean, they do have the same, they have impact, but can you give any examples of that in film, art, theater, or music where it was actually, that was a tipping point to change a law? I mean, I can't, but I have a feeling that somebody in the room could. Right. <laughs> Anyways, for those but, who came in late, we will open it up to the entire room after the 90-minute point starting at 4 o'clock, so at uh, 5.30. But um, keep thinking, and of course, everybody should keep thinking about them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I really love that movie, Changing Places, Trading Places. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I love it because I already think that way. And tell us what you learned from it, or what is it? <clears throat> well, it's it's about uh, somebody, you know, a poor homeless man, who's uh, who trades places with a Wall Street banker, uh -huh. stockbroker, and uh, it's kind of engineered by this Wall Street's uh, partners who want to teach him some kind of lesson. Uh huh. And so the Wall Street guy just winds up homeless in dirty clothes with no money. His credit is cut off. And it's just sort of beautiful to watch. But I don't think it's going to change anything. It right. just resonates. Resonating is very good. Yeah. I love that word. Thank you. Yeah. So a screenwriting teacher told me that he thought a great piece of art, a great film, is when you can clearly see the intention of the maker. Hmm. Someone uh, talking to uh, people about this, a filmmaker said, well, Stanley Kubrick says the opposite. A great film or a great piece of art is when you can clearly not see the intention of the maker. What role does intention have in your creative process? Let's say in your poetry writing to start. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> my poetry came from two separate places, and one was just kind of playful and... and uh, silly in a way uh, whimsical uh, sometimes they would come straight out of dreams I would just write down a dream um, 
and uh, like Freud's slipper shuffle, I dreamed that uh, I dreamed that I was somehow I dreamed that I was a man and that uh, Freud was sitting by my bed wearing the slippers my mother gave him. And <laughs> it went on from there. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> but you have done some political poetry, so right. you, uh, you have intention. So you're saying intention yeah. plays a role in some of your work it and does. not all of them. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and and then that that usually that stimulation is usually come from. You know, a uh, newspaper article, or the radio story, or just from something. Uh, um, I mean, I'm a feminist, so a ten point plan for female emancipation. You know, stuff that I right. think about quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, very good. Duchamp said, "There's no art without an audience." What role does the audience play? when you're, say, writing the poem? Are you thinking of your audience while you're writing the poem? Um, no. And I think if I start thinking about the audience, I won't be able to do anything. Mm. Just, you know, because I'll have a tendency to want to please, and that's very stifling. Mm. So you said growing up your mom would read you Ogden Nash and Poets. she teach me to read it. Te teach you to read it, very good. So... At what point did you go, oh, I can do that? You know, where did it flip over from just reading and consuming poems and writing to the point where you go, oh, I can do that? Um, you know, just in school, I would just write the occasional little poem like kids do. And, um, and, and then when I got into college, um, I ran kind of a, a poetry salon. But I... Truthfully, I never really, I never really thought of myself as a poet. I just d wrote this stuff, and then um, when I got into performance art, it was my text. Actually, I always thought that what I was writing was were experimental songs. Really? <laughs> you know, without music and without rhyming and without <laughs> instruments. <laughs> That's good. And uh, and so. Yeah, it never, I never really took on that mantle. What happened was that because I was doing performance art and it was text based, um, people started inviting me to read my text. And it was so much easier than having all the props and the music and the dancing boys and the. <laughs> Beautiful. What yeah. college was that? Oh, um, I, I, I went briefly to Orange Coast College, got published in there literary journal right yeah and when you said experimental songs that's interesting because i know you were a songwriter too or you're still a songwriter no i was i was you was song. did mm -hmm. the songwriting come before or after the poetry or you know what's the um well the stuff that i put into words people started inviting me to to read so are you saying did, did then the did you go oh i can turn that into a song and you wrote the music too or did other people write the music for this oh no 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 i was i was playing the guitar and and you right. know just sort of the two were kind of coming out simultaneously fusing same time yeah, yeah. <laughs> so McLuhan talks about everything we invent extends some human part of us so like clothing is an extension of our skin knife and fork extends our teeth mm -hmm. uh Film editing is a, an extension of blinking. Mm -hmm. What does the writing utensil extend for you, whether it's a pencil or a pen or a keyboard? Oh, I, it feels like an, <clears throat> an externalization of, of, of my internal state. And, um, you know, growing up in foster homes, you're not allowed to speak. So you feel like you grow up with a pillow over your face. So you just have what builds up in you is this tremendous desire to to be heard, you know, to be seen, to be known, that. Mm. Yeah. Amazing. So would you were you able to bond with your fellow foster children and go and talk about it? Well, you're in you're in a home um, and the, the the other child in the home is their real child. Oh, is their real child. So you're really Cinderella. You're just there to do the to wash up and to sweep and to vacuum and clean the bathroom. 
and you're not you can't bond with them no and they do lord it over you wow and um the great irony like is that in the foster home where i lived the longest that boy who was treated like a little prince and who had every privilege became a juvenile delinquent and went to jail so that didn't happen to my brother and I. My brother is a, my brother is a, a sociology professor. <laughs> that shows to go. You put that in your smoking pipe. Okay, so that that brings up a question. You're you're so good because you're getting into my uh, deep in my subconscious and off the script of my question. I I met a kid when he was ten years old and he was raised a Buddhist. Mm-hmm. And then four years later, I saw him again, and I hadn't seen him in those four years. And I said, now you've been raised a Buddhist for quite a while. What's the most important thing you've learned being raised a Buddhist, do you think? And he goes, not to hate. Hmm. And I thought, that sounds good, but it seems that humans innately hate. Mm -hmm. And so did you hate that? I mean, did you... Maybe that's a heavy word, but was there hate? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, and you know, the seeds of that are still with me. And uh, I, you know, I have incredible rage inside that I have to deal with. And and uh, yeah. Yeah. Because that's that's Ram Dass said uh, back to the enemy question. He says, "I'm having a real hard time loving George Bush." <laughs> Because, I mean, what does hating George Bush do, really? Does yeah, it help us? Right. You know, and he's going, you know, we got to love George Bush. He's like, yeah, you're Ram Dass, you can. But he's going, no, I'm, I'm in trouble loving him. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I think it's human to hate, but what does it do in the long run? Well, sure, it just creates those bad chemicals and... yeah. You know, it, I mean, and I don't know what positive things come out of it, really. But, but bad chemicals might be what we have to get out of our system in order to love. Could be. Well, maybe we don't have to have them in the first place. Christ. Maybe there we don't go. need to generate them at all. Yeah. Well, that goes to Gregory Bateson, who's a great thinker, says, um, you know, does punishment really work? So he says, if a criminal is caught robbing your house... Does he actually think he just didn't have his criminal skills up to snuff, or does he think morally he was doing something wrong? And Bateson says, well, usually it's more like they just didn't think they had their criminal skills up to snuff. They might not really think, like George Bush might not think he's killing kids and other. He thinks he's doing the job president should do run a war machine and so he didn't mind i think killing kids and others that's just what do they call it by uh collateral collateral damage, damage. Oh. and so then what Bateson says is in the long run if that's the way it is explained that way then does punishment do anything like if we if we if we put kissinger in jail as a war criminal what will that do well, it will keep him off the street. <laughs> Please. <laughs> that is gay. <laughs> I think you should be the president. <laughs> um, so onward and upward. Um, McLuhan said there's no such thing as a good or a bad movie. It's a good or a bad viewing experience. Hmm. Any comment? tend to go along with that about 90 99% maybe. Yeah. Cuz a lot of times your experience of the film is colored by who's sitting next to you. If it's their taste or so or even the whole audience. The whole audience exactly. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, how about the people in Colorado? They're watching Batman oh, wow. And, yeah. the, and then they, oh, this is—is is this a joke? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, blood squirting out of the person next to them. Yeah. And then the thing that just creeped me out is they insisted to go back and watch the end of the movie. Are you crazy? How could you ever go back into that theater and even go near that movie again? Yeah, that would. But be maybe a, that was their yeah. resolve too. They're like, oh, well, I, I, yeah, I, I did hear people talk about it. Yeah. So what about poetry? Is that the same thing? There's no such thing as a good or bad poem. It's just a good or bad he- hearing experience of the poem. I, you know, not be a, a real poet 
because I hang out with people who have studied poetry, who teach poetry, who live poetry every second. And and for me, poetry is just a, is a part, I shouldn't say just, but it's a yeah. part of, of self-expression. I majored yeah. in film at UCLA. I play yeah. music. It's just, you know, so it's a part of something. But I know that people who really know poetry, that, you know, they can make judgments. And yeah. it, it's like getting a meal. Yeah. Um, some meals are just better than others. Yeah. So I'm not a real good uh, poetry critic, but... yeah. I know what I like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so um, Michael Apted has got his another film out this, this week. You know, his 28 and Up series. Great filmmaker. Made Coal Miner's Daughter. About 30 years ago, I asked him a question. Um, why do rock video editors feel so obliged to edit fast? And this is the same time when Marty Scorsese said... I edit my films faster because of MTV. It had such an impact. And so um, Michael said, well, because people have learned to take in information faster. This, the wording on this question is definitely slanted, but it is, <laughs> do you think we've learned, we can learn to take in information faster or are we just brainwashed to believe we can? Hmm, well, I mean, I think that we can take in information faster. We can but, learn to take it in faster. But I also think that it degrades uh, our whole experience of information and, you know, I, I think it degrades the inner life. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm devouring. I'm just a hog for information. Yeah. And I can hardly retain anything anymore. Yeah. I'm just, you know... I'm the same way. I love to take in information. <laughs> then, but, then all you got to do is go. Just Google it. <laughs> you forget anything. That's all. It's just like a verb. I see, like so. these guys working on the streets and and their construction workers. They just Google it. But it feels like eating too fast. Like you yeah. don't really digest it. Right. Well, it's called power browsing. Oh. They said, "Oh, power browsing's ruined the world." Because in yeah. the old days, we would go to footnotes and then we'd study where they got their information. Now it's just like. Vroom. Yeah, and it, it is crazy because sometimes I, I wish that Y2K had really happened. <laughs> <laughs> so that we wouldn't just be chained to the computers. <clears throat> but, um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's easier in some ways yeah. and harder in others. So yeah. what can you do? Now, do you think it's literally possible to multitask? I, I know that I do it all the time, but it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, I mean, if you mean to really do to really do the two tasks, no. Yeah. But but Lord knows we'll try until yeah. the end of days. Now, Jean Luc Godard told Michael Moore um, when Fahrenheit 9/11 came out at the Cannes Film Festival, he said, "This film is going to help Bush get elected." Now, it not necessarily helped Bush get elected, but it galvanized pro-Bush people. With this slew of last 20 years, we've had an amazing slew of political documentaries. Do you think, the bottom line question is, do you think they more activate people or more pacify people? I think that we're buried under such a deluge of information and stuff coming at us that, that you just feel tired and busy all the time, which, um, which I think you know, tends to make people more passive. Yeah. Because they need to recover. And so that's the problem. But but I mean one you know, like I'm thinking about Black Hawk Down, did that make people be against the war more? Yeah. <coughs> it seemed to me like it was speaking to people who already thought the way that it Yeah. Yeah. Cindy Sheehan says, We're just speaking to the choir and there isn't even a choir <laughs> anymore. <laughs> But, I mean, it is true that when, um, you know, when one party or one persuasion is in power, that that galvanizes the other side. Yeah. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, Battle of Algiers, which I think is the greatest political doc ever made, was used by the Black Panthers as a training film. And George Bush used it as a training film, too. So that's pretty amazing about, you know, activating... <laughs> some sort of awareness of a subject right and it's a fake documentary basically <laughs> to top it off <laughs> hmm. <laughs> 
No, but you know the thing in that movie was just the idea that that you just had one person had two people, and then those people had two people. That stayed with me forever. Oh yeah, and it's super powerful. Yeah. Um, Linda, what was the motive of the cave artist? The motive. Yeah. I guess yeah. Just the same thing. I. You know, when I see something really beautiful or wonderful or something that touches me, I want to own it, to have it be a part of me, to devour it. To, and I think that's it. I think that they were so, you know, moved by the power of the and the grace and the beauty of, and the magnificence of these animals. That that's their way of owning them, you know, owning them at night, owning them in their cave, owning them, yeah. That's amazing because at the beginning you sort of answered the part I didn't ask was is the motive still the same for artists in general? Well, I mean it is for me, but I but I, but I also think that art is a business and that yeah. the people who know the business of art are going about it in a very different way. Yeah. Yeah, well, Warhol said that art is business now. So Right. You know. I mean, I mean people who really succeed as painters they know things. I mean, I have. I don't have a clue about what yeah. they know, but but they they know it, you know, to the core, and yeah. they know how to pursue it. It's like and Damien, they have a business yeah. plan. Like Damien and her, skip the gallery, just go right to Christie's, man. <laughs> so, Linda, what is more important, conviction or compromise? What is more important, conviction or compromise? Looking at. Uh, Looking at today's Congress, I would say compromise. <laughs> <laughs> no, conviction isn't getting us any. I mean, conviction is just leading us. Conviction is tearing the country apart. People have these idiotic convictions. Yeah. You know, learn to compromise. Yeah. I mean, a few people look on the edges should have some conviction. But when, the, you know, the whole Congress has conviction. Good. Or maybe it's not conviction. I mean, yeah. maybe it's... No, it's definitely conviction on the right. That's on the good. left, it's let's get reelected. It's <laughs> good. You can answer the question. You can ask the question and answer it. I like you. <laughs> You're my kind of gal. <laughs> but uh, it's funny because I asked... I've been at, that's one of my oldest questions, uh -huh. which I got from Christine McKenna. Uh -huh. And I love it took 30 years before someone goes, what's more important, conviction or compromise? This welfare lawyer told me, depends on what you mean by important. <laughs> no matter what, everyone would always concentrate on conviction or compromise. And they didn't realize there's another word in that question. That is, excellent. That is important. So is ambition based more on fear or joy? Hmm. Ambition, based more on fear or joy. I'm just taking a stab in the dark here. I think it's fear. <laughs> I think it's, you know, what do they think of me? What if they get ahead of me? What if I can't, you know, be a part of that anymore? What if? Yeah. I think it's what if, what if, what if. Yeah. Never having thought about it before, but. Mm, that's good. Thank that's you. That's the and first. Is loyalty based on reason? No. What do you it's think just, it's based on? I mean, I, I just think it's based on um, fellow feeling and caring, yeah. you know, for something, someone. Yeah. I'm glad and, you brought up... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, and, and kind of a sense of honor, too. Sense of honor, yeah. yeah. Staying honor or getting honor. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm glad you brought up feeling because I forgot these two questions. And first question is, been exploring a lot, is... Do you think humans are more head or more heart? Are we more feeling or are we more think? And, you know, both of us know it's both and it depends. Um, yeah, I think it's more heart. More heart? We're more heart? Yeah. Yeah, but because we're easily swayed by emotions. Um, in fact, that's, you know, what modern politics is. Yeah. It's, um, it's PR. Hello? That's yeah. uh, they say uh, politics is just a branch of the entertainment business. It is. In if fact, you, yeah. Yeah. In fact, that's how Bush, uh, Obama got elected because he hired George Lakoff. 
And Lakoff said, uh, yeah, uh, quit going for issues and go for feeling. Hope. We all said, <laughs> hey, bring yes, it on. Completely. It worked. And then he fired him. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, uh, Change you could believe in. <laughs> <laughs> so um, do you, can thoughts create emotions? Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. I can. Oh, wait, wait. No, I got. Wait, yeah, that's backwards? right. Can thoughts create emotions? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I can work myself into a funk right now. <laughs> <laughs> you are fun. I love you. Okay. So the next question is: Is here's the hot new pop sensation topic, neuroscience. Does the brain more detect consciousness or create consciousness? I just, I have no idea. Yeah. Maybe our esteemed guests will answer Okay, later. wait, it's coming up <laughs> when we open it up. But that is that is like, you know, are we, is it like detecting it or is it creating it? Wow. So, yeah. That's the, uh, okay, so T.S. Eliot said that poetry is outing your inner dialogue. Yeah, that makes sense. What language is your inner dialogue in? As in English or Malinky? Well, that's the thing. Here's how I usually go slash, but I wait until they have, then I go slash what form is your inner consciousness in. So if it's in English, that's fine, but is it in something more than just English or is it just in English? That's oh, fine. it's in pictures and, um, and sentences or fragments of sentences. Yeah. And yeah, sometimes it is just a, a little burst of emotion. Yeah. 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 Um, great uh, founder of Ann Arbor Film Festival, George Manupelli, his mantra is ignore yourself. Sort of the East Coast George Manupelli is uh, Jonas Mikas. He says there's no self-expression. In fact, the great jazz um, pianist. Oops. <laughs> a minute point. I know that. Great jazz pianist Cecil Taylor says, I'm just a vehicle and this stuff just comes through me. So this question, again, is sort of one of those either-ors, but you'll get the sense of it. Is art making more self-expression or more just vehicles for whatever culture is dominant or whatever technology is dominant? Um, I know people who devote themselves to art and they said that they've gone to parts of the country where people are so disconnected from the dominant culture that their art is nonsensical. So... That's a good, yeah, good I, answer. I, yeah. Do you think art making can be egoless? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know what egoless means exactly. Yeah. I'm, because I always see these guys, these gurus, talking about egolessness, and they just seem so involved with themselves. <laughs> like Christian Murdy. <laughs> That's good. I like him, but I, I know what you're saying, yeah. yeah. Um, is perception reality? Oh, well, I mean, these days, what they say that um, appearances are everything. So, I mean, the whole world is running on appearances now. So, it's not really reality, but it's, yeah. it's the reality that we all, we all follow. On what occasion do you lie? That one I stole from Marcel Proust, so... <laughs> hmm, well, I certainly lie whenever anyone asks me my age. <laughs> I forgot to ask you what year you were born before we started. Well, I would <laughs> most certainly lie. <laughs> oh, what else? What else? Oh, yeah, I lie in office politics. I lie then. Um, yeah. That's good. I like Tom Waits. He says, what occasion do you lie? He says, I didn't know I needed an occasion. <laughs> <laughs> I love people who laugh. Thank you. So you sort of answered this, but I'm because I'm trying to get you to come to our Finnegan's Wake Reading Club at least once. Do 
McLuhan probed Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce, saying that artists dream awake or can dream awake. Everybody in this room, we have a commonality. We all create these scenarios in the middle of the night because we have these creative powers that we dream. They're saying that you can also use those creative powers while you're awake. So have dreams played a role in your creative process? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just, um, you know, at times. Uh, not some, I mean, I don't dream as much anymore as viv vividly. But, yeah, I always used to dream whole stories or a whole song or, or a poem. Um, and then you just get up and write it down? Yeah. Yeah. And... Um, Linda, why do you think it's so difficult for humans to consider the possibility that life may be pointless? Wow. Why is it difficult? Yeah. Well, I think we have to keep going. You know, we need a reason to continue to go. And as far as I can tell, uh, that's what religion is invented for, to keep us from feeling that life is pointless. Yeah and to keep us feeling that life is endless. Yeah. Lewis Carroll says, I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Have you believed in any impossible things lately? Hmm. I mean, I have to say that I'm serious about the bicycles. I just really... <clears throat> I, I think about that a lot. I really want us to make stuff that people will use everywhere in the world instead of yeah. things that blow up and are you know yeah. just a waste of everything. And I, I, I mean, you talk about winning hearts and minds, please give them something they can use. Yeah. If I mean, if the if one of the major points of the war is to keep our economy going, we can make things and give them to people who need them, for Pete's sake. And it goes back to your whole thing about, you know, instead of being against war, be for peace. Yeah. yeah. So it seems like an impossible dream, but I keep dreaming it. Yeah. Well, if you don't have dreams, your dreams don't come true. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so what elements of your, say, poetry writing, your performance art, Say one major element that's changed since you first started, and one major element that's remained the same. Well, to me, all of the uh, avenues of expression are pretty much the same. You know, if if it's a film, if it's a poem, if it's a song, it it just feels like an externalization of an internal state. Yeah. So, I have to say, because I'm caring for my mom, who's 89, she has congestive heart failure and dementia, she needs a lot of care, that I experience that as a creative, as a very different kind of creative act. Um, it's very, it's tiny and it's personal and nobody's watching, I don't have an audience for it, but I have to really be in tune with her and try to figure out, you know, if she's in distress or in pain or if something's not working, what it is, why it is, how to make it better. Because she sees her doctor for 20 minutes. It's on me. So it does become a very creative act. And, and, and yet it, it, it's, it's small, personal, and not right. in front of an audience. So that's, yeah. That's wonderful. Because, you know, that's the baby boomer's dilemma. What do we do with our parents? Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. that's beautiful. Treat it as a performance art piece. <laughs> <laughs> that nobody's watching. No one's watching. <laughs> No, and the, you'll the whole, never, the whole you'll world's never, watching. It'll never be reviewed. It'll never be recognized. But that, and your friends will be doing such fun things. <laughs> um, in fact, anticipate this question. Well, American Indians and Eastern cultures respect their elders. Can you explain Western cultures' disdain for old age? I think because... Um, the movie industry bloomed here and you know you see somebody's face on that screen it, it's 20 feet high or whatever you know and there's the, let's face it youth is beautiful yeah so 
I imagine that when the rest of the world catches up to, with us, uh, uh, you know, uh, with the cinema, yeah, that uh, they'll be doing the same. <laughs> Um, Moshe Feldenkrais works with healing and movement. He says it's literally possible to identify a weakness and incorporate it to become a strength rather than we're normally taught to overcome a weakness. Can you tell us a weakness that you've actually incorporated to become a strength? Wow. A weakness that I've incorporated to become a strength. Hmm. I, I have to say I've never thought about that. And when I'm at home alone, I can think of thousands of weaknesses. That at the <laughs> I seem to be weakness free. <laughs> I love that. I think that should be the title of this interview Weakness Free. Yes. <laughs> no, that was good. Believe me. If you come up with it, you can tell. Us. Well, uh, Joseph Boyes, the great artist, said, Make the secrets productive. And Lou Welsh, great beat poet, said, guard the secrets, constantly reveal them. Then, just two weeks ago in the New York Times, I found the root of all that with Thornton Wilder in 1928. He said, art is confession. Art is the secret told. But art is not only the desire to tell it, but it's also the desire to tell it and hide it at the same time. Mm. Can you tell us the role of secrets in your creative process? Mm. Mm. Um... You know, I just always feel so really different from everybody, maybe because of my upbringing. So I'm always trying to pretend that I'm like everyone else. And, uh, yeah, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe they know. Uh, <laughs> fooled me. <laughs> I thought you were as weird as me all along. Oh. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, this is fun. Thank you. Um, can anger be a productive emotion? Hmm. Um, yeah, because um, a lot of times I tend to be passive and let things roll over me. So I have to really be angry to uh, have a boundary or, uh, you know, get something reasonable for myself. Great. Can satire be destructive? <laughs> How can things that make you laugh ever be destructive? <laughs> <laughs> the, my one friend says, that's the job of satire. <laughs> exactly. Well, there you go. Isn't that great? But no, that is the truth. That is the truth. Yes. But, but, you know, if you satirize something in some countries, they kill you. You could consider that destructive. If you're dead, because you because you, you did the wrong cartoon or something. Yeah. You know, but uh, believe me, I'm I'm, I think that is the job of. But it's not the satire itself. Well, yeah, there's it's, definitely more. Yeah. Yeah. Some people are just too damn sensitive. Yeah. <laughs> um. There's a line that goes, "You create what you resist." Comedian Bob Goldthwait took it one step further. He says, "You are what you hate." Can you, um, well, actually, Joyce said it well, too. He says, it is a curious thing how your mind is super saturated with the religion in which you say you disbelieve. And then Louis Bunuel topped it off. He said, thank God I'm an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what, do, <laughs> what do you think of this, this line, not meaning you, but... You, one creates what one resists. You create what you resist. What do you think of that? Well, I mean, the thing that comes to me is just what you were talking about, that original statement about um, I'm against war. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, the drug war just makes it escalate and escalate and escalate. Yeah. And the war on poverty just escalate, escalate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, Let's make peace with drugs. Yeah, that, that <laughs> no, Lily Thomas says um, drugs are for people who can't face reality. No, reality is for people who can't face drugs. <laughs> 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 but but that guy at KPFK, because I know you're a big KPFK yeah, oh, yeah. listener like yeah. me, yay for radio. Uh -huh. He said uh, he worked for the drug government, the government drug guy, and he says, 
you can't, and he turned, on, he like went on our side, and he goes, he goes, you can't have war against drugs because drugs don't fight. <laughs> And you can't say no to drugs because drugs don't talk. <laughs> El perfecto. Um, Linda, how do you find peace of mind? Hmm. Peace of mind. Well, I mean, I, I do breathing exercises. <laughs> um... Peace of mind. I, yeah, I guess I'm. I guess my friends mean a lot to me, and uh, you know, just the people that have been in my life for a long time. Yeah, that's that's a great source of peace of mind. And well, it's funny because the first question I asked you was, "What's the best thing for a human being?" Yeah. The woman who taught me that question worked with um, Wilhelm Reich. Or study Wilhelm Reich. Uh -huh. She says the best thing for a human being is another human being. Yeah, that's so. That's and so. it's not that there's any right answer, but yeah. it's sort of. It is. Yeah, it's and, amazing. Yeah. How do you find peace of mind is often, you know, a, a, an amazing, uh, revealing question when I ask it. You know how, you know. Well, I, I've actually been really crazy in my life. And. Um, been difficult to be around and I've <clears throat> been kind of an alienating person so pulled the wool over my eyes <laughs> <laughs> I always thought you were fun <laughs> well uh, <laughs> you know you, ju you just have to live with me for a few years and then you get to know the real <laughs> but um, you know one human being that stood by me during all those times is Frank Lutz he's here today great um, if you were walking down the street today and you met yourself as a 12-year-old, what would you say to your 12-year-old self? I, I, I think I would say, um, I think I would say, because I, I was locked in my room when I was 12. Uh, yeah. Just, you know, all the time. Um, and I think I would say, ask for a pen and paper, and um, you know, I'm sorry nobody's coming to rescue you now, but they'll be there later. Hmm. Beautiful. Linda, which way should toilet paper come off the roll? Over or under? Over. Clearly, over. Why over? <laughs> it's just so much easier to pull it off that way. <laughs> Thank you. You know, <laughs> slap your hand down the top. And <laughs> if a publisher was to release your autobiography, just off the top of your head, what would the title be? PFFT. <laughs> yeah. That is good. That's a wakey. And see, I know you're you're bound to come to the wake. That's a wake word. That's Finneganese. Now, listen, Linda. They go. We would like to scent the glue in the binding of your autobiography. What smell would it be? Mm, violet. Violet. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. If a statue was built in your honor, where would you want it displayed, and what would it be made of? Hmm. I I guess I would like it in Salt Lake City. <laughs> and what would it be made of? Um, it would be made with salt covered with gold. Oh, wow. <laughs> like the angel Moroni. Beautiful. Except he's not made of salt. Oh. <laughs> he's all gold. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell me something good you never had and you never want. Something good I never had and I never want. Yeah. Wow. That's a toughie. Hmm. Well, can you, can I ask you what your good thing that you never wanted? I, I can tell you about five of my favorite answers. <laughs> <laughs> but what is yours? Mine. Uh, well, I have to think about it. I'll tell you. <laughs> what I usually get is heroin, fame, or money. Oh, heroin, fame, or money? Yeah, those are the three most popular answers to the question. Huh. Then. Um, I thought one of the funniest was an expensive funeral. <laughs> it's good, never had it, never wanted it. Uh, and then um, probably what you're, you're, you would like is uh, Johnny Carson's answer was, I don't know what it is, but when you find out, tell me. <laughs> 
exactly. That's a, yeah. <laughs> oh, actually, Mike Kelly's was really happy. Yeah. Kids. Oh. They're good. Yeah. Never had it. Never wanted. Yeah. Because his girlfriend was handing over him, going, "Give me the baby, or I'm out of here." So it's an amazing question because it sort of is zooms in on what's wow. the biggest thing in your life. Wow. You know, because it's uh -huh. that fear factor. Yeah. Actually, it's a. I stole that question from neuro linguistic programming. Wow. <laughs> See, because they, when they ask you, when you ask someone that question, uh -huh. you watch which way their eyes go, and then you can determine if they're this type of person or that. But I, I don't know how to do it, but I thought, Dang. that's still a good question. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay. Oh, Susie doesn't like this question, but she's not here, so I'll ask it anyways. If you were in a vat of vomit up to your neck and someone threw a bag of shit at your face, what would you do? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> No, I don't like that question. That's either. all right. You can. You, we can pass over. I I'm, I'm, shouldn't ask. It. I, you know, but I just thought I'd give it a little, a little levity. No, okay. A moment um, of levity. What is the healthiest cultural shift you see developing today? Uh, well, I'd say, I mean, it seems to me that the millennials are really involved. You think the, so? Yeah. So I hear. I yeah. mean, I don't know any personally. <laughs> <laughs> But I hear that they, you know, that they're very, uh, they're, they're, they're community oriented. It's not all me. It's not necessarily the, you know, greed is not good anymore. Yeah. And uh, they're out helping people. And uh, honestly, I love that uh, jubilee, you know, that, um, <coughs> that Occupy is, uh, Occupy has raised money to pay off people's medical bills. That's what, that's just beautiful. It is. Isn't that just grand? Oh, I think Occupy is amazing. And yeah. They, and after a year, they go, well, what happened to it? What they're doing now? I says, there was on the front page of the L.A. Times. What happened to Occupy after one year? Uh -huh. They're on the front page of the L.A. Times. That's what they were <laughs> after. To, to say, we're occupying you to think, you know. They're doing things. I yeah. mean, they're saving people's homes. But I mean, they have said they have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay people's medical bills. That's amazing. What? That's yeah. just gorgeous. Yeah, my friend says they're just kids who want to get stoned and laid. I goes, that's all we were. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with that? I know. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, they're back, doing stuff. Yeah. They're changing things. I do encourage everyone to go to the Occupy film series in Venice too. It's amazing. He, Robbie just moves along with dialogue, film clips. Yeah. And so on to that, it's a good way to go into this question. So when um, Egypt first happened, whatever that was a couple of years ago, every, all the lefties in America were like, wow, cool. Then it came to America and it happened in Wisconsin and all these people hit the streets. And a friend of mine said, well, the difference was that the issue in Egypt was about responsibilities and the issue in Madison was about rights. So what is for you, whether you agree with that or not, just in general, what do you think the difference between rights and responsibilities is? Boy, I was sure going to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, I, I guess, like we we have a right to to a place to live, a right to a job, a right to to food, a right to health care. I mean, one yeah. hopes that we have rights yeah. to those things. Um, and but I, responsibility. I guess the responsibility would be us as a collective government providing those things. Yeah. So it's which end you're on or something. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because uh, you're political. Would you mind if we go into a few political let's, questions? Oh, yeah. Let's. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, if you were ruler of the world, what would you do on your first day? I would make everybody vote. I swear. Right. Every on. single person. I that like that. That would be the mo That yeah, on things that that affect them. I, I people go. 
It doesn't matter. You're you're empowering them. It's a question of Tweedledee or Tweedledum or the bumper sticker. If God wanted us to vote, he would have created candidates. I go, look at the psychology of you going to the polls is alone an amazing thing. It's the tiniest molecule of democracy. Yeah. I mean, do you care about it or not? Yeah. That's the molecule. There are yeah. many more things that you need to do Two. to keep it alive. Yeah, very good. And um, Utah Phillips said, anarchy is making rules for yourself, not others. Hmm. What, do you, what is anarchy to you? How would you define anarchy? I always thought that anarchy was a place where people were so responsible that, that they didn't necessarily need rules, but I... That's well put, yeah. huh? So this great socialist guy said, uh, John Basil Barnhill, he said, where the people fear the government, you have tyranny. Where the government fears the people, you have liberty. Sounds right to me. Sounds right to me. I mean, yeah. unfortunately, the whole fear of the government is has made its way into this gun issue. Yeah. That's why people are afraid to give them up. And that's why they want those, those um, you know, weapons of war in their homes. Yeah. Because they think they're going to have to use them. Of course, it's not I help very much when the drone comes peering in their window. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's interesting because it's such a huge issue now whether we should have stricter gun control and whether that will help. Yeah. And um, are you for more gun control laws? Well, I I really don't like having these assault weapons. Yeah. um, But... I, I did hear an analysis that said there's so many of them in the homes now that just banning them won't really cut down on the violence for many decades. Yeah. Well, in fact, guns guns are really hardy. There's still guns from the Revolutionary War that are, you know, guns never wear out. Yeah. So banning them just means that fewer of them will supposedly get into the, in, into the streets, but yeah. they're going to be around. They're just going to yeah. be there. Why? Well, the day after the Connecticut happened, I just did a survey to people and I go, do you think banning cigarette commercials from TV and magazines helped a little? And they go, yeah, probably. And then I go, do you think banning automatic weapons would help a little? No. Wow. Like immediately, people would, and this one lady goes, you're trying to trick me. (laughs) I go, "I, I just asked you two questions. I'm just curious. Because I'm in generally not for yeah. making laws. What we want to create is a, a society that, where people feel responsible. Right. And when you make a law, what you do is you make the possibility to break the law. Yeah. That's really all you're doing yeah. in a lot of ways. But we sort of all agree, well, let's make a law. You all stop at a stop sign. Well, don't you want everybody just to realize you get to this corner and everybody looks and then you, you know. But, well, some people are saying that, you know, all of those massacres were created by people who are on um, mind-altering um, Pharmaceuti- medic- pharmaceutical, legal drugs. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so that's an issue. And, oh, and, that's huge. And they're not able to be responsible. Right. Well, so. the kid in Colorado gave his shrink a piece of paper and says, I'm going to go kill a bunch of people. And she took it to the authorities, and they went, they ignored it. So, yeah. you know. I like what they do in um, Switzerland, though, where they really do um, make it very difficult to get the ammunition. Yeah. Just ban the bullets. Yeah, ban Let the Let them go around and <laughs> carry their guns all they want. Just don't give them any bullets. Or, or you know, my, one of my 10-point plans for female uh, emancipation was, was, was gun control that women only should be allowed to carry guns. Hey, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> well, who needs it more than we do? <laughs> I mean, you know, they're saying, oh, no, everybody should carry a gun. Yeah, I really want to have a gun against that 20-year-old sharpshooter, you know? Yeah. See who wins that shootout at the old cake corral. Right. Well, that was funny. When Thelma and Louise came out, uh-huh. it was just such a hit. Yeah. And I thought, well, it's a good film. But everybody cheers when she shoots the guy in the leg. And I'm like... Jeez, wait a minute. But you know, I mean, I've never been a fan of Clint Eastwood either. But then people told me the reason was because we never have female protagonists in movies. Exactly. So, <laughs> so are you for the death penalty? No. Just, yeah. 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 
I mean, it doesn't it doesn't prevent anything. Yeah. It costs it it costs so much money. Let's just be practical. Just yeah. on the practical level. It's yeah. millions. Yeah. And yeah, I don't I don't think we the state should be in the business of killing people. Yeah. Um, this is a few questions from a great film called Problema, where they ask 17 questions, all these modern thinkers. And the uh, first question is, should we have the right to choose where we live? And this is thinking more mm. in a global scale. Like, should everyone in the world have a right to choose where they live? I mean, I have always felt that that's true. However, I also feel that there are just too many people in the world. I mean, zero population growth yeah. would make that easier. Yeah. What if all Chinese people want a car? <laughs> We're doomed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, we should all be making cars go away. Trains and... Yeah. Are you an optimist or a pessimist? Hmm... Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't even on my list. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I used to be an optimist, and now I'm a pessimist. <laughs> but the reason I asked you, because they asked McLuhan, are you an optimist or a pessimist? He says, I'm an apocalypse. We're fucked. <laughs> yeah. But the funny thing is, is that when you go to Etymology, my favorite website in the world, you find out what the word apocalypse is from uh -huh. to reveal. Mm -hmm. So that's really, Mar all Marsha was was like Toto. He was just pulling the curtain. Uh -huh. He says, I'm not starting the fire, I'm just turning the alarm on. <laughs> look, look. Yeah, look. <laughs> Duh. Let's just say I'm putting my cans of tuna aside. Um, <laughs> what does courage mean now? Encourage me now. I mean, it seems to me not a lot. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, like how people say I'm a survivor and the toughest thing they had to do all day was get their nails done. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I don't know. Um, does our wealth depend on the third world being poor? Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, but if we have 60% of the world's, what, we have 6% of the population and 60% of the resources? There, I mean, nobody else even gets to come up to our level. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we either, there either have to be fewer of us so that we can share a lot or... I mean, there has to be one toothbrush for the whole country. <laughs> well, you know, earlier, what I love you saying is, like, drop bicycles on people and not bombs. And uh, I love that. That's beautiful. And um, it reminded me of Dick Gregory saying, why do we try to force democracy on other countries? It doesn't even work here. Exactly. No, and we're not doing a very good job of protecting yeah. it or knowing what it means or yeah. caring about it. Yeah. And it's slipping away. Yeah. How do we stop our governments from going to war? Um, I think we have to take, which I don't know if it would be prob if it would be possible, take the profit out of armaments. Good. That's my solution. Yeah. You know, uh, we at Spanto we showed Clay's film on Vietnam, uh, Vietnam American Holocaust, uh -huh. and it was packed room. We were doing like a test screening, and there were six punks in the street. Yeah, you know, they're called uh, in Venice. We call them uh, um, aristocrats. Uh, uh, oh God, I can't. Aristocrats. No, uh, can't think of the word. Sorry, I just passed my mind. Anyways, they're like street punks. Okay, they're the kids who, um, crusties, excuse me. They're called crusties. You know all the kids on the boardwalk that yeah. are like, you know, because there's so much dirt at them, there's oh, crust. Oh, oh. So they have their own language. They call them, we're aristocrats. <laughs> <laughs> so they were like crusties in the front row. And I go, you know, one of the ways we could stop wars with no one goes to work and no one buys anything. 
and our economy would collapse. And the, the kids in the front would go, that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, bullshit, you buy potato chips. <laughs> Doesn't exactly. matter. If yeah. there's just one thing you're buying, I mean no buying anything. Yeah, there you go. So um, why is there no peace in the Middle East yet? Oh, man. I mean, I'm sorry. I just think it's so unfairly skewed toward Israel. Yeah. But I guess I'm in the minority in America. Yeah. Although um, in Israel, I wouldn't be in the minority. Yeah. Because they're, you know, more Israelis think that the policy is unfair than Americans do. Yeah. So. Yeah. And uh, why are the myths, no, what are the myths that we need to create to change the world for the better? The myths we need to create to change the world for the better. Um, I think the myth, well, I mean, I, look, only smallness succeeds <laughs> instead of too big to fail. It's <laughs> yeah, good. Um, that would be one. That's good. Wall Street, Schmall Street. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> anyway. Um, Linda, why are most artists liberal? I don't know that they are. Really? I have met so many artists who don't vote, who I heard poets say that they were really excited when we went to war in Iraq, huh. but I guess huh. most artists are liberal. Um, yeah, yeah, most artists really do have, they, they, um, they're traveling with their ear closer to the ground. They have a, um, you know, more a finger on the pulse of what's going on. Yeah. They're more acquainted with truth and reality. Hmm. I have just been shocked, though, at, cer at yeah. certain... Yeah. Certain reactionary artists run across. Very good. I just have a couple more questions, then we'll open it up to the audience. And the uh, next question is about uh, blame. Wh what is the function of blame? You know, uh, there's a movie of uh, Steinbeck's uh, book, Grapes of Wrath, and the guy's standing there with a gun. And uh, one of his peer group comes by to, and says, you got to get off your land because we're going to build a road here. doesn't matter. And so he says, well, my grandfather farmed this land, my dad farmed this land, I farm this land, we own this land, then who do I shoot? Ah. <laughs> you know, and so what, what is the function of blame and are we just hardwired to blame? Well, I, I think there are two different kinds, or probably several different kinds of blame. I know... I like to blame when I like to throw the spotlight away from myself. <laughs> it's their right. fault. It's the fault of the person who's outside the room right now. You know, that sort of thing. Right. But, um, but I also, I mean, listen, I blame Reagan. I blame Cheney. Right. Yeah. I, you know, I blame these guys for a lot of things. And I, and I think um, it, focuses, it focuses your attention on what behaviors went awry. Good. Very That's good. That's my sense of it. Thank you. And then this question is sort of the same for competition. Are we hardwired for competition? One gentleman says that games were created to give non-heroes the illusion of winning. In <laughs> real life, you don't know who really won or lost, but you can tell who a hero is and who is not. You know, what is the thing with competition? You think it's needed? Do we have to have competition? I, I think competition... Um I think the way we use it, it's it's kind of a function of capitalism, and that there might be other systems in which it wasn't so important. And to me, there's something really weird about the competitiveness of football yeah. or certain violent sports. Yeah. You know, uh, Manny Farber, great abstract expressionist and film critic, he says, "What's this deal with measuring?" It's like this the thing about building aesthetics is so much like that was a good film or that was a bad film or yeah. eight or a ten. And he, he says, Why do we have to have measuring so dominant hmm. in developing critical thinking? Hmm. So, last question before we open up to the audience is what gives you the most optimism? You know, again, um, I just have to refer back to the yeah. millennials and 
I have to yeah. say that um, that jubilee just yeah. lifted my heart. Yeah. And 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 I think there are lots of little grassroots things like that going on. Yeah. You know, people are creating their own communities now. Yeah. People are creating their own money. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's so many people getting together to do the right thing. Yeah. You know, to to restore our food integrity. Uh, you know, our our justice integrity. Yeah. Um, all of that. I agree. Linda, it's been a pleasure and an Absolutely. honor. Absolutely. Thank you Thank so you. much. Bravo. So don't be shy. Who has a question or a comment? Well, I, I have, well, I could have lots of comments. <laughs> I have two questions for Linda. And, and one is, you know, what does that have to do with the function of getting older? Yeah. And, and I was wondering, because you're a very observant person, in my experience. So what... What, what do, you, do you get nostalgic for anything? And then the other side of that is, is what do you look forward to in your future? Mm. <laughs> good question. Very good. Um, well, you know, I do notice as the decades tick by that I don't have the energy that I used to. I, I mean, I just think when I see somebody dancing their, just dancing their head off, I just think I wish I could still do that, you know. Or, or sometimes I'll just look at a child, and you know how children are always <laughs> like, could I just be that way every minute? <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I just look forward to getting my bills paid. <laughs> Oh, good. Yes. What about the past? Well, that was, that was sort of like a two-parter. Well, if you don't remember, we'll come back to you. Yeah, sure. Anybody else, comments or questions, don't be shy. Okay. I have a question. Um, when you say energy, do you mean just physical energy? No, I guess I mean um, the thoughts aren't coming as fast or furious anymore either. Joseph. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe you don't want to talk about this, but I don't know you. So you mentioned you went to a foster home. Yes. Um, what was the situation about? What prompted you to go there? Both of my parents came from extremely broken homes. My mother was raised in a Mormon context, and um, it was, you know, it was almost like compound. It was almost like being a compound Mormon. And she had to break away from that. So uh, she was pretty much left on her own and she had, uh, she had me, I was born to her when she was 18 years old and then she had my brother four years later and she married my dad who, his mother shot his father when my dad was young not that my grandfather died, but he did move out of the house, and then my my dad was <laughs> my dad was yeah, left to live with the meanest woman on the planet. And this has been you know reported by other people who have met my grandmother on my dad's side. So both of them just came. They had no idea what it meant to grow up, to trust, to have a family, to you know pretty much on the Mormon side I know for sure um, because my great grandfather was um, a polygamist and they lived in Mexico so where they could practice polygamy my great grandfather had four wives and my great grandmother was the wife who lived in a tent um, while his other wife lived in the brick house and my great grandmother had to go out and work when all her children when her eight children were very small so they were left they were just kind of abandoned because she had to go to the other colonies. Um, she was a nurse and she had to travel to the other colonies. They were left alone all the time. They, um, my, my great grandfather would steal their shoes for his family in the brick house. They would have to work in the brambles, you know, in bare feet. And so it was just this whole, these people came from, from these two strains of just deprivation 
and not knowing how to, you know, really have a family. My my father worked out of the country. He was gone all the time. Sometimes he would send money to my mother. Sometimes he wouldn't. She had such a hard time. And then I've never really known the exact reason. I know that my mother did eventually become an alcoholic, although I don't think she was an alcoholic then. But I think that my father, I think that he wanted to, um, you know how sometimes they use the children as pawns? I think that he wanted to get back at her for something, so he took us and put us in a foster home, and that was when the real nightmare began. Well, thank you. All right, anyone else comment or question? Let's, can we, you're going to forget it, go ahead, let me do it now and then go to those. No, no, go ahead. I can okay, go ahead, back there. <laughs> So you just had a really great interview for an hour and a half with some, with some I thought, excellent questions and, and, uh, and interesting. Would you like to do that to other people, to the interviewer? <laughs> Pardon me? Was like that a question for me? Yeah, he's saying, would you like to interview people? Um, like what, what just happened? I am a great admirer of your skill and the time that you've put into this. And I, to me, it would be like taking on a new art form that I would not really be prepared to do because I think it takes a lot of focus and a lot of preparation. And you have been doing this for years. Thank you. But it's like uh, I, when I first got inspired, especially by, you know, I, I grew up watching uh, Mike Douglas with my mom interview people and like, most of the people in here, we watch people interview. Terry Gross, all these people interview. And, and uh, Christine McKenna said it so well, she goes, it was like I could just go sit in some famous person's house or next to him and talk to him. So, I mean, it's just like a, it's like a, a cheesy way of saying, could we exchange some ideas together? But yeah, it was a great question. Go ahead, anyone else? that um going back to the my earlier energy question <laughs> um that so you don't have a um it's not just physical energy it's, right. it's like a psychological or mental or whatever right um, and thoughts not coming would you say that the thoughts don't come due to low energy or that the thoughts are energy um, you know, I, I think that I think that it may have a lot to do with how demanding it is to care for an elderly parent, because you're not just taking care of yourself; you're taking care of a whole other person, every single thing that they need, and you're still trying to work, and you're still trying to have a friend occasionally, and you're still trying to catch a movie once in a while. It's just, yeah. So, and plus. Now you've got to think about their schedule because they have to have a medication at this time and this time and this time and they have to have a meal and everything is, has to happen. So you're always thinking of that next thing and it's not, yeah, so I'm nostalgic of a time when I didn't have those responsibilities and where my, you know, my life and my thoughts were just my own and, and they could wander wherever they could and now I've kind of got to rein it in because it's always got to be, well, at 1.30 the coumadin has to happen and then, it, you know. Yeah. Good. Well, I, well, just a comment too. This has been really fun watching here because I, you're, you're, there's, there's no baloney about you. You've always been a very honest person. Again, in my experience. So it's fun seeing that. You know, when you're talking in a public venue and people, I assume not everybody here knows you, to see that come out. But my question is, um, is you know, since you're an artist and you express and, and really expose yourself in a lot of different ways. I mean, you've, you've accomplished in a lot of different areas. What, uh, is there anything that, that you would like to, uh, people to know about you that maybe they don't know? I, maybe you asked this earlier because I came in a few minutes late. Well, that's a, that's a good question. I, I really felt so strange about being raised not at home for my, most of my life. So that's kind of the thing that I'm letting out more now because it's really shaped me so much and is such a part of who I am that in order to be known I feel that I really want to open up about that more and that's what I've been doing yeah. anybody else who hasn't 
Oh, go ahead. Uh, all your quotes remind me. My mom always liked to quote Harvey, a, a line from Harvey, which said, you could go through life um, oh so pleasant or oh so clever, and I prefer pleasant is how Harvey put it. Um, how would you respond? Is that for me or for you? Well, that, that question's for you, but I like it. You mean Harvey, the James Stewart movie? Or? Yeah. James Stewart. The, rabbit. Yeah. the rabbit. The big rabbit? Yeah. Yeah, so it's Harvey. clever or... Pleasant. You know, I think, um, even though I have a very abrasive side, in, I mostly try to be a people pleaser. So the cleverness sounds really fun to me. <laughs> <laughs> what does he say? He well, said he pleasant. Pre pleasant. Oh, he says pleasant? Yeah. And is that a, a famous novel before the film? Or? Yeah. It was a play. Is it? It was a play. Oh, it was a play. Yeah. yeah. It was a play before. before yeah. There's a number of great things. <laughs> that is a, that's a great film. Anyone else? Go ahead. so much in terms of forms of expression. Uh, do you see yourself evolving in different ways? Thank you. You know, I've always sort of seen it in decades. And I really wanted this decade to be the decade of dance. <laughs> and so the absence of energy is really annoying me. <laughs> and time. But <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. Yeah. But um, do you feel, just an extension of that, do you feel that there's some things that you still need to do in terms of some forms that you need to explore or, or to be in order to, to fulfill who you are? I do. And now is just not the right time because I have these responsibilities, but there are other things that I want to do. And I mean, there are things in the, that I've done in the past that I want to do more of. And um, I really love playing Af West African music. You know, I played with Prince Jabate and his band for 10 years. And um, I still would like to do that. I, I mean, he lives in France, but I performed with some other West African musicians and I just, I just don't have the time to keep it up now. So, go ahead. I was gonna ask, um, are there any uh, like, um, be it like uh, performance artists or musicians or even like filmmakers that have like really influenced you or inspired you? Well, I I was able to work with um, this group that Alicia and I worked with, Lynn Hickson. And we did a lot of, uh, we did several pieces together. Mm -hmm. And of course, and as, as I mentioned, I don't know if you were here when I was talking about Charles Duncan and all his friends. Um, uh, Alicia was part of that and there were several other members of that. And, and they just were, it was just a constant creative ferment because they were always, you know, his, um, his estranged wife, Toby. <laughs> She and I worked on a dance for about a year that was really a dance, and a, you know, together that was really fun. We did all these several huge pieces with Lynn Hickson that would have uh, a dozen or two dozen or maybe more performers. Sometimes we would perform at night, um, lit by car headlights um, outside. Um, and we, we worked together for years, and that was just really, uh, that was a big, that was a major influence. Major, major influence. What about like artists that um, that you were that you might have been influenced by um, that you observed while you were an audience member or a viewer of the art, as opposed to? Um, well, I started out in life as a as a singer songwriter, and but again, it was easier for me to be influenced by the people that were around me. I mean, I was a roommate with the birds and and Taj Mahal was a good friend of mine and we we you know, hung out and played music together and went bike riding and fishing and and Linda Ronstadt um, lived down the street and we were always kind of hanging out. So 
Yeah. Go ahead. So, Linda, with this extraordinarily time-consuming and all-consuming task that you have now with your mum, do you find um, time to be able to write? No, it. Um, the thing. I mean, I feel lucky just to to have a, a little bit of a social life. Um, th the thing about doing creative work for me is that it's it's the glacier, and it, most of it's underwater. You just need so much time, empty time, to percolate and to think and. I just don't have that because it's not just that little tip above the water that where you're creating and writing. I just I just don't have it. Yeah. Anyone else? Go ahead. Kind of on that subject. Uh, do you have do you, one example when you do write, when you were writing, when you are writing? One example of a mechanical way that you solve a creative problem is something like, uh, you know, the. Does it more come to you when you're on a roll type of creativity, or do you see the tip of the iceberg, kind of like you're saying, and then the rest you just have to really flesh out? Like, do you solve. Do you find the underwater part of the iceberg when you're just thinking for some time in idleness or whatever? Or do you have to like sit down with pencil paper and flesh it out? What kind of a creator are you? No, it's it's more like if you have a lifestyle that ha where you have a lot of free time, and you can meander here and there, but also be a part of a community because that was the great thing about uh, that whole artistic community is that we were just around each other all the time, and you know they were they were putting out an art magazine, and and sometimes it would happen in the living room and. You, you were just around it all the time. It was just constant stimulation and opportunity to, because I was doing performance art, opportunity to perform and and uh, I, you know, a lot of what a lot of what I I did came about in Lynn Hickson's workshops because I would she would ask us to create pieces for her for her spectaculars. And you'd create many more than were needed. And it was just sort of in free time, or is an idea struck you, or, yeah, might be driving and have a thought. <laughs> I have a question for you. If so are you asking, is it more like a mathematical problem you're working out, or is it just in a, a rush of creativity? Is that what, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I, I guess it sort of takes, takes you over. Um, well, sort of. I mean, it's, I don't know, because everyone has a different creative process. And so I, I don't, I've heard some people who say uh, they have an inspiration for maybe a line or like a, a couple lines, and then they'll just take it and in kind of like a mathematical way, a mechanical way of just like manipulating things and trying different things, experimenting with different things, and then go back saying, oh, I like that one, I like this one. Like, but it's all like pencil, paper, uh, you know, just, but you were saying more of kind of like you're around a creative sort of stimulation all the time, so yeah, so uh, it was more mostly natural and organic. Uh, I mean, honestly, one of the things that people remember that I performed on stage is a piece called I'm So Busy. <laughs> and I just I, I just thought of it and, and put it down on a put it down in a tape recorder. It took, you know, a minute. And, and it was done. So yeah, for you, it's more uh, when, right when it comes to you, more spontaneous. Yeah. Sort of like you're back to the head and heart question. Is it more head or is it more heart? And it's also, you're sort of touched on a question I ask sometimes is, do you have any rituals or routines in your creative process? That's sort of what you were asking. You sort of, you do need a table yeah. and I don't really have, you need a special place and I don't have that either right now because yeah. I'm in a smaller place. Like some people need a 
certain kind of paper, certain kind of pencil, yeah, certain kind of coffee or radio in the back or whatever, just certain things. They asked Paulo uh, Coelho, who wrote The Alchemist, so do you like go under a tree and write? He goes, no, I have to be in an office where there's fax machines and all this noise. <laughs> you know, so uh-huh. it's like, what? <laughs> okay, did you have a question or comment? Sort of involving a lot of things that just said. It was all in Well, um, my mom gave me a guitar when I was a teenager, and so I self-taught that, you know. And then I learned to play it and learn songs and and started ha- writing songs and hanging out with songwriters. And I lived in I lived in Newport Beach. I lived in Hollywood. Um, I lived in Colorado. So that was. Right, but now I'm pretty much a constant companion of an 89 year old woman. How long have you been? I've heard you talk before about people in Venice. Uh huh. Venice, thanks to Jerry and Venice events. How long have you been in Venice? Oh, well, I've I've been in Venice for I, uh, 30 or 40 years, something like that. Yeah. And how do you, in terms of time, how do you find time? Keep up with the rest of the world. What, what's your news source? Oh, um, KPFK, Russia TV. Those are the two primary. And when it was, I, they just took current off of my, off of my cable. But Russia TV, current, and KPFK. That, that's the RT.com online. Yeah. Oh. Well, um, I actually get it on my, I actually get television news 24 hours, uh, nice. RT 24 yeah. hours a day. The only time I ever heard of that news source before was from someone who's, I think, 18 years old. He gets all news, news. Yeah. so I think you're very much in touch <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, that was, a, I, I was going to ask earlier, is, you know, kids <clears throat> watch uh, John Stewart and Colbert for their news. Yeah. And we grew up with Mad Magazines. There's not much difference. Our, our parents grew up. I, our parents grew up with uh, Johnny Carson coming out, cutting down the president for two minutes, and then moving on. So we've always had that sort of satirical or fake news. Yeah. But now it's sort of like the dominant. Uh huh. That that's they only get their news from. And do you find that more activating or pacifying? I mean, it's sort of like. A lot of my friends love Amy Goodman, but only for the first five minutes, and then they turn it off because they can't handle 60 minutes of just hardcore G, 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 G. And so, you know, I'm for hardcore, good, solid investigative journalism, but it's also you need a little breather in there. So, you know. I like Amy Goodman a lot, and a lot yeah. of times I'll listen for the full yeah. uh, hour. But you know, you just know when you've had enough. Yeah. Sturm and drung. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you think you, you got your passion for active voting? That's unusual among. Oh, yeah. you know, I, I was a film uh, major in UCLA and when I went there, you went there, 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 we were encouraged to, t- to study philosophy and history and literature. And I took, um, I took a class with Arnold Kaufman, who wrote The Radical Liberal. And he was just a wonderful uh, political philosophy teacher. I studied, I took a lot of classes with him because he was my favorite teacher in school. And um, I mi- up, wound up minoring in political philosophy and that was his that was one of the major things that I got from him is that we need to participate in the decisions that affect our lives and that is the most important thing that we must do even if by law it should be done even if it has to be done by law that we participate in the decisions that affect us so. yeah it's so few people vote because I've been in poll cap for 15 years yeah. one year we have 15,000 1,500 potential voters in our district 12 people showed up. I sit there for 12 hours. That's one person per hour. People yeah. come in. Good turnout this year? I always go, are you kidding? This girl worked with me. Younger girl says, don't say that. Say, we're 
we're hoping there's going to be more. <laughs> it's like nobody votes and th compared to what they should. And yeah. it's like, give them five dollars to vote anything. Yeah. You know, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Linda, do you have a guilty pleasure? Oh, I love yeah. that question. <laughs> You're not going to narrow it down to a topic? Well, doesn't everybody love chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> that is a good guilty <laughs> Yeah, It's yeah. very good for you. That's right. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. And our uh, events calendars, our uh, flyers are right outside that curtain. Our website's laughtears.com. we got a ton of great events this week including movies on Monday night with some real radical avant-garde composers. And Linda, it has been beyond a pleasure and an honor. Thank, Thank you so you much. Thank you so much.